if you were not here Wednesday night, if uh, you haven't listened to that message online, or even if you were here on Wednesday night, you need to listen to that message again. Well, I was thinking about it this morning. I said, you know, we heard from the heart of our pastor Wednesday night, but we heard from the heart of God Wednesday night. So if you haven't had an opportunity to listen to that lesson, uh, you need to listen to it. Amen. It will challenge you and it will inspire you. And so today for a, a few moments, as I put my eyes on here, I want to talk on this topic, the greatest Heist. The greatest heist. I knew that. If you turn with me in your Bibles, I um, just want to read a portion of Scripture. Revelations chapter 3, verse 20 says this. It says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him. And he with me. Jesus is standing at the door of the church, knocking to be let back in. Amen. If we read, I guess I should have started in verse 14. It says, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, and they that thou art neither cold nor hot, and I will and I would that you were cold or hot, so then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not. I think that's a key phrase in the scripture. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Behold. I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. And in an effort to express what I feel to teach this morning, let's go to John chapter 10, uh, beginning in verse 7. The scripture said, And Jesus said unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. And all that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep do not hear them. Let's give down to verse 10. It says, The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And I pray today that this lesson is a wake-up call to us. The fact is that the thief is real and ready to steal, kill, and destroy. As I studied, I, I looked up the greatest heist that was ever committed. And there were several. Actually, there's a list of top ten. Uh, this on that list was number two, but number one... They caught the guys. So I was like, well, how can that be a greatest heist if you got caught? But this was the one next to it. It's what is known as the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum heist. It is the single largest property theft in the world. I think they have some pictures. There we go. It says the theft up there. I call it the heist. But in the early hours of March 18th, 1990, while the entire city of Boston celebrated St. Patrick's Day by chugging beer and smack talking the Yankees, a, uh, a vehicle pulled up near the side entrance of the museum. Two men in police uniforms pushed the museum buzzer and stated they were responding to a disturbance and requested to be let in. The guard on duty broke protocol and allowed them through the employee entrance. entrance. At the fake officer's request, he stepped away from the watch desk. He and a second security guard were handcuffed and tied up in the basement of the museum. And the thieves departed with 13 of the gardener's works of art, 
81 minutes later. The missing pieces include Rembrandt, Manet, and a few of Degas, estimated at $500 million total. And today, if you go empty frames currently hang in the room in homage to the missing art and in hopes that they will one day be returned. This is one of the greater unsolved mysteries in American crime. <clears throat> if you are interested, the return of Gardner's works remains a top priority. The museum continues to actively investigate the theft and works in partnership with the FBI and the U U.S. Attorney's Office. There is a $10 million reward for information leading directly to the recovery of all 13 works of art in good condition and a separate $100,000 reward for the Napoleonic Finale. And if you have any information, <laughs> you can contact the Director of Security. Go to the website, you don't know the name and the number. Greatest, isn't it interesting? They broke in and took the works of arts, but the frames are still there. Just in case they come back. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 43, the Bible says this. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and finding, findeth none. Then he says, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he, and taketh with himself seven other spirits, more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall be also unto this wicked generation. When, uh, when we come to Jesus... When we repent of our sins or baptized in Jesus' name and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, that unclean spirit that possessed us, the carnal, dynamic, addicted, filthy, wretched spirit that controlled us, it leaves you. Amen? Okay. That's why the Bible says in John chapter 8, verse 36, If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Right? When He sets you free, you're free indeed. That, that spirit of carnality, that spirit of, of, of sin, that spirit of bondage, that spirit of addiction that once possessed you, when you receive the Holy Ghost, when the Spirit of God comes in you, that spirit goes. Your house, your spirit becomes clean. Amen? The chains that used to bind you and me are no longer on our wrists but are laying at our feet. Let me tell you, when, when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you receive power. And the Spirit cleans house. Amen? A word that is used later is the word garnished or adorned in proper order. So when Jesus finds you, we were lost disheveled amen but when he comes and he fills us with his holy spirit amen our house becomes clean and garnished and adorned it's kind of like uh jesus when he cast the demons out of the demoniac from gadara amen in mark chapter 5 we read and they came over into the other side of the sea into the country of the gatherings and when he was come out of the ship immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. And listen to this description of this man who had his dwelling among the tombs and no man could bind him, no, not with chains because he had been often bound with fetters and chains and the chains had been plucked asunder by him and the fetters broken in pieces. Neither could any man tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, the Bible says that he ran and worshipped him. 
sat up there. Yeah, and, and worshiped him. And they come to Jesus in verse 15. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with a devil and that had the legion. And how was he now after his encounter with Jesus Christ? The Bible says that he is clothed and in his right mind. When Jesus comes, when you have an experience with Jesus, my friend, you do not leave the same way you came. Now, I didn't say when you come to church, you leave the same way you came. I say when you come and have an experience with Jesus Christ, you do not leave the same way you came. Anytime you come into this house and you experience Jesus Christ, you leave better than when you came in. Amen? He, he cleansed the house. He, he does not disappoint. He does his part. You come and you praise Jesus. He does his part. He shows up. You open your heart and you ask Jesus to purge you and wash you and cleanse you. Guess what? He does his part. When you repent of your sin, he forgives you of your sin. He cleanses you. He washes you. He redeems you. He gets it right every time. He will always do his part. He doesn't disappoint. Just like this, this Denomiac from Gadara, when he came and he worshipped him, when that encounter ended, this man was naked. He was eating wild animals. They couldn't bind him. They couldn't tame him. But when he came and worshipped Jesus, the next we read of him, he was clean, he was clothed, and he was in his right mind. When you come and you worship Jesus, when you come and you magnify the King of Kings, something happens. Jesus changes you. Well, what happens is when you receive the Spirit of God, you become possessed with God. And where he is, the devil has to flee. And that's why Jesus was saying in this verse, he was saying that when the house is cleaned. When Jesus comes, the house is cleaned. It's garnished. It's adorned. Because he doesn't disappoint. So the question is, is Jesus comes and does his part, do we do our part? When he cleans house, you know why he cleans it? So he can possess it. The Langles has recently bought a house that they're going to rent out. They spent, I guess, the last week and a half after the people that lived there moved out. Doing what? Cleaning it. I, I ran into them at, at Lowe's the other day with Sister Langle and, and, and Tony, and they were buying baseboards that she said she had a stain because... Nobody wants to move into a mess, but neither is this Jesus. So when he fills you with the Holy Ghost and his spirit, he cleanses. That's why you can come to Jesus addicted and you can leave free. You can come as a sinner and leave saved. You can come empty and leave filled with his Holy Spirit. Because he cleans house and he never disappoints. He is not going to move into a mess. He's going to cleanse your mess out. That's why he died. That's why we're baptized in Jesus' name. It washes. Oh, hallelujah. It washes the house so that his spirit can fill you. Amen. But he cleans it. In John chapter 14, verse 17, it says, Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive... Because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, but shall be where? He shall be in you. He cleans his house to possess you. Amen. And John 14, 18 says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16, it says this, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16, it says this, And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. 
as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. When God comes and he fills you with the Holy Ghost, he possess you. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. First John chapter 3 verse 24 says this, And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. Hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. Amen. When you are filled with the Holy Ghost, God comes and possesses you. And in John, we read that Jesus is the door. He becomes the door, the way. In John chapter 10, verse 7 says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, I am the door of the sheep. And all they that came before me are thieves and robbers. Now, Jesus, I believe in this scripture, was referring to those that came before him. The thieves and the robbers were the false prophets and the Pharisees and scribes that pretended to show another way to salvation. But we in our life have those that came before Jesus. You say thieves and robbers, that's kind of a, how do you say it, a duplicate of words. But actually there is a difference because a thief there is defined as somebody that is cunning and stealth. Somebody who just sneaks, sneaks in and takes what doesn't belong to them. An example of this would be Judas. He walked for Jesus for three and a half years, but we know his intent wasn't right. And then the robber. The robber just openly comes and beats you up and takes your wallet. Kind of like Barabbas. We all have had that that came before Jesus, that spirit that stole from you your peace and your joy and maybe even your family. You know, that that was before Jesus are thieves and robbers. And I, I would like to remind you here that the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And as great as Jesus has been to us, He has saved us, He has cleansed us, He has delivered us, and time and time and time again, He's picked us back up and He's lifted our heads and, and He's encouraged us and He's given us the power to, to live another day. He has given us the strength to just, just do what we didn't think we could ever do. Yet somehow, when we locate him in the book of Revelations, he is knocking on our door. What happened? What went on? I want to tell you today that isolation is dangerous. When you separate yourself from the body of, of Christ and the church, you, you put yourself vulnerable to the thief. If we are not careful, if we are not eating of the Word of God, if we are not drinking of the Spirit of God, if we are not attending church and we are forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, if we are not being faithful in our private devotions, if we are not keeping our heart filled and our house filled with Jesus, the house becomes empty. I tell you, we find reasons to go everywhere else, yet neglect to attend his house. We look for reasons not to praise. And we can become easily distracted. We focus more on what is happening around us than focusing on our Savior. And the result can be that if we're not careful, is that our house becomes empty. Because what possessed us 
is no longer there. Because we've neglected to take care of our possessor. And thus it creates a space for the thief and the robber to enter in through fear, through self-justification. You hear it, don't you? You hear it. I hear it at Walmart. I hear it at the mall. Oh, yeah, I've been to Walmart. I've been to the mall. I have my mask on. My wife makes sure I use hand sanitizer, and she takes good care of me. But I hear it. Self-justification, just not ready. At the mall now, I tell my wife riding down the road, we went to, I had to go to Atlanta yesterday, and the traffic, I tell her, ain't nobody scared of COVID. Ain't nobody scared of COVID. You go to Walmart, ain't nobody scared of COVID. Come on now. Really? Go to Lowe's. People ain't scared of COVID. But you come to church, people are scared of COVID. That's the truth anyway. You may like it or not, that's the truth. And what happens is that we become deceived. And we become isolated and become lukewarm. And then we wonder, where's Jesus? I'll tell you where Jesus is. He's knocking at your door. Through fear, self-justification, self-righteousness, and spiritual carelessness. And Jesus warned. He said, the carnal spirit that left you will return again. And if the house is vacant, he comes to the door of the sheep. And if Jesus is not there, that spirit brings company. And the spirit finds it empty, swept, and garnished. And you know what he says? Oh, somebody just cleaned it up for me. And the spirit brings others, and they come. But what do they come for? They come to steal, they come to kill. And they come to destroy. They come to take you back where you came from. And they're not playing. It's not something that's going to end when this, when this pandemic ends. If you're not taking care of it now, don't think you're going to be able to take care of it later because he doesn't come alone. When he finds an empty house, he brings spirits that are worse. And Jesus said it. He said the end state will be worse than the beginning. You thought you were bad before, but let me tell you, you give place to the devil. You'll be worse than you ever were. A spirit brings others to steal, to kill, and to destroy that is why fear reigns and compromise flourishes. And we justify it. Our Laodicean lukewarm way of life. And he tells us in, in Revelations chapter 3. And knowest not. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Why? Somehow, Jesus has stepped out. And he's on the outside wanting to come back in. I'm reminded of Samson in Judges chapter 16. And she made him sleep on her knees. And she called for a man and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head. And she began to afflict him and his strength went from him. And she said... The Philistines are upon thee, Samson. And he woke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as other times before and shake myself. The next portion of the scripture is tragic when he says, and he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. What? He didn't recognize it. 
He didn't recognize that in his time of compromise, in his time of not taking care of his house, in a time when he was lazadaisical and he wasn't in possession or allowed himself to be possessed with the Spirit of God, he didn't recognize that somehow Jesus or, or God had slipped out and was knocking. And what possessed him was no longer strength and power to overcome, but it was a carnal spirit that couldn't defeat the enemy. And the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with fetters of brass. And he did grind in the prison house. And all the while, Jesus is knocking. And I will say this today. The greatest heist is not the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum heist. The greatest heist is when a child of God is careless with their relationship with their Savior and somehow he slipped out of their lives and now instead of possessing his treasure, he's outside knocking to be back in, to be let back in. The enemy is demolishing the renovated house. And we don't know. We don't know. He's destroying. And we don't recognize. Because we've allowed fear, self-righteousness, self-justification to take the place of a relationship with Jesus Christ. We've allowed our carnal mind, which is the enemy of God, to convince us we don't need to be in the house of God. Convince us that when we're here, we don't need to praise When we're here, we don't need to worship. You can come to church and be entertained, but I'm telling you what changes you is an experience with Jesus. Because his love is greater than our weakness because he gives us an opportunity. And Revelation says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Then he says this. He says, be zealous, therefore, and repent. You know what that means? Want me back more than anything and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, Oh, Just because he's been kicked out doesn't mean he doesn't want back in. He said, if any man hear my voice and, and, and open, open the door. Well, how do you open the door? He tells you, you repent. You get it right with God. Be zealous. Come to an altar of repentance. Open that door. He says, I will come where? Into him. Oh, And we'll sup with him and he with me. Jesus wants to get back into the church. Jesus wants to get back into your life. Today is a day to repent and reconcile. Today is a day to open the door. His reward is so much greater than $10 million or $100,000. or in John chapter 14, verse 2, we could all stand. It says this, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And that's not a proclamation for a future tense. That's right now. 
the kingdom of God is not something that's going to take place later. It's something that's happening right now. We need to find our way back, church. We need to find our way back. Don't lose out. The greatest heist is not a work of art. You, my brother, you, my sister, are the greatest heist. The price that he paid for you, no else is willing to pay. Today, we need to open our heart and let Jesus back in. What is it that keeps you awake at night? What is it that doesn't let you sleep? Well, you need to reflect and say, what is possessing me? If you allow fear to possess you, it will destroy you. If you let compromise possess you, it will kill you. It will kill me physically. Jesus really referred to the physical or the carnal. He's talking about his relationship with you. Where is that today? What connection? Are you filled with the Spirit? Is your house possessed with the Holy Spirit today? Or is it empty? And you wonder, well, why am I falling back to the things I used to? Because maybe that clean house is getting repossessed by what used to possess it. And I, I, I feel this in the Holy Ghost. I've been working on this for two or three weeks because I felt it so strong is that we need to get repossessed with the Spirit of God before we get repossessed with what we used to be. Amen? You know, you know where the devil has taken you. You know those carnal tendencies that you have that you hate, but at times you can't help. Well, what happens? Possession. You're filled or you're empty. And if you're empty, it gives place to the devil. And he'll take you. And he ain't playing. But Jesus says, I'm standing here. Hope I don't knock this over and knocking. And he's standing there right now today, knocking. The question is, will you open the door and let him back in? Let's pray together. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your many blessings. Thank you for your word, Lord. Help us. Dear Lord, receive it, accept it. Open our heart that throughout this service today, there will be doors that are slammed open or, or kicked open, Lord. Doors that are opened, dear God, that will give place to you. Neglect, dear God, be repented of. Compromise, be repented of. And allow your spirit, dear God, to re-enter into hearts and souls and minds of people. That when we leave this place, we will have had an experience with you. I know, Lord, that today you will not disappoint when we open and we worship you. Lord, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name. And just stand a moment, please. Put in your hands. Say thank you, Lord, for this special moment in your presence. Thank you, God. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, glory, 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 glory. Hallelujah. hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. The presence of the Lord is here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We love you, Lord. Oh, gracias, Señor. Gracias. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Aplauda un momento. Just give the Lord, Lord the Señor, a hand clap of praise just for a moment. And magnify Hallelujah. the King of Kings. Glory, glory, and Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Uh, el salmista escribió. El salmista escribió. The psalmist wrote. Si Jehová no edificare la casa. Except the Lord build the house. 
En vano trabajan los que la edifican. They labor in vain that built it. Si el Señor no guarda la ciudad, except the Lord keep the city, en vano vela la guardia. The watchman walketh in vain. En otras palabras, in other words, necesitamos a Dios. We need God edificando nuestra casa, building our house. Él trabaja en nuestra casa. He, and wor he works in our house. Él necesita estar en nuestra casa. He needs to be in our house. Pero no solamente el Señor es el constructor de nuestra casa. But the Lord isn't the only one that builds our house. Él también es el fundamento de nuestra casa. He is the foundation of our house. Nuestra casa está fundada. Our house is founded sobre la roca upon the rock que es Jesucristo. that is Jesus Christ. No solamente es el que construye la casa. He not only builds the house. No solamente es el fundamento de la casa. He not only is the foundation of the house. Pero él también es la cabeza. He is also the head of él the house. Él es la cabeza. He is also the head of él the house. Él es la cabeza. He is Hallelujah. also the head of the house. Hallelujah. Por eso nuestra vida está escondida en Jesucristo. That's why our our life is hid in Jesus Christ. Vivimos adentro del cuerpo de Jesucristo. Because we live in the body of Christ. Y estamos protegidos. And we are protected. Estamos asegurados. We are assured. En Cristo Jesús. In Jesus Christ. No importa. It doesn't matter. Que venga un río con fuerza. A if a forceful river comes. O un viento huracanado con fuerza. Or a gusting wind. Que venga contra nuestra casa. That comes against our house. Las tormentas no tumban casas. The winds do not tear down houses. Las tormentas no destruyen casas. Winds don't destroy houses. Si la casa está en el fundamento. If the house is founded. Que es Jesucristo. In Jesus Christ. No importa. It doesn't matter. Que venga virus. If, if rivers. Pandemias. Pandemics. A pandemics. Que vengan problemas. Problems that come. Estamos seguros en We Jesucristo. We are sure in Jesus Christ. Nada nos puede mover de estar en la casa de Dios. Nothing can move us from being in the house of the Lord. Dios está en el cielo. The Lord is in the heaven. Pero también está aquí esta mañana. But he's here also this morning. Y qué bueno que nosotros sepamos. And it would be good for us to know. Que somos la casa de Dios. That we are the house of God. De un aplauso al Señor. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. De un aplauso al Señor. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Él vive, aleluya. Él vive, Amen. él vive. Amen. Amen. Cante al Señor esta mañana. Sing it to the Lord this morning. Yes, the Lord, oh my ones. Yes, the Lord. Oh, oh. 
worship this for you, Jesus. It's all for you, Jesus. It's all for you, Jesus. You deserve it, Lord. You deserve it, Lord. Oh, let's give God a hand clap of praise. Come on, let's give him a hand clap of praise. Our praise is what defeats the enemy. Yeah. Hallelujah, he has to flee. He don't like you when you're praising our God. Amen, he loses his power and authority. You may be seated if you like. Praise the Lord. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. We need to remember Lyra Sheffield. She's still in need of our prayer. They had transferred her to a nursing home to help rehabilitate her leg. And uh, we're just asking God to cover her with prayer. Also, Gary Wolf needs complete healing in his body and restoration. Also, Brother Hatfield's sister passed away this morning. We're asking that you keep him and his family in prayer. Brother David Hinkle is leaving for basic training, and we need to lift him up in prayer, and he will be returning sometime in May uh, in our vicinity, I think. And then also a young lady by the name of Lori Sewell. She desires a closer walk with God. And I don't know about you, but I remember when I had that desire that compelled me to an altar of repentance and filled me with the Holy Ghost and baptized me in Jesus' name. I, I remember wanting a closer walk with the Lord and I know you do too and so let's remember her and ask that God would fulfill that desire this morning you know if you're seeking for an anchor in turbulent times I've got a passage for you this morning Isaiah 41 and 10 tells us fear thou not for I am with thee be not dismayed for I am thy God I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Isaiah tells us who the source of our strength is. It's the Lord, and he promises us his strength, his power, and his might. Oh, I'm glad I depend on the Lord Jesus Christ as my strength. But it's interesting to note that within this one scripture, he gives us also two commands. He says, do not fear and don't be dismayed. In other words, don't be bewildered or anxious about anything. And I want you to know this morning that often Satan uses the trap of distraction to try to get your focus off of God and on your situations. And if he can grab your attention and he can cause you to focus on your problems and fear, then God loses all his power in your life. But if you reverse that and say, God, you are my source, you are my strength, you are my might and my power, I will not fear, that is your command and I am gonna obey then we enthrone the Lord back in our lives. And I want you to know Satan tries to override our faith by causing us to fear, but that's not in this place this morning. I will not fear what man can say or do unto me. I hope you feel the same way this morning. Uh, this pandemic has caused so much fear and anxiety. The devil is a liar. They're lying. There are people that are telling untruths in the news, and we've got to stand on what God tells us in his word. Amen? How many of you are going to take this scripture? You're going to mark it in your Bibles, and every time you feel a little anxious, every time you feel a little fearful, you're going to go back to the word of God and say, I will not fear. My God is with me. He is my strength. He's my power and the source of an overcoming spirit. Why don't we go to the Lord in prayer this morning? If you need an anchor, this is it. This is exactly what you need. The Word of God is an anchor that's going to keep you steady in the faith. How many of you have a need this morning that only God can meet? Amen. Why don't we signify that by the raising of our hands? Oh, yes, there's trouble all around us, but we're not troubled because God is on our side. He's the anchor that we need in turbulent times. Oh, he's the source of my strength, and I'm not going to be afraid. I'm not going to be dismayed. God's got you this morning. 
Shall we bow our heads and pray? Why don't we lift both hands and become a funnel of his glory? Oh, precious God. God, I will not fear, Lord Jesus, because you are my help. Lord God, you are steadfast, immovable, Lord God. And Lord, I'm so glad that we're relying on you this morning. You see the needs all over this sanctuary. You see the hurting hearts. You see the disappointment, Lord God. You see the physical afflictions, God. And Lord, we know that you are able to cure, heal, and deliver every situation because you are our source. Lord, we pray for those today that need your touch for Sister Lear and Brother Wolf. We pray, Lord God, for the Hatfields that, Lord, you would comfort them during the loss of sister and sister-in-law. Lord, we pray that you would meet Lori Sewell, Lord God, right where she's at right now, God, and let her draw closer to you. Lord, we thank you right now for all that you're about to do, and we worship you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, and we know, according to your word, you're going to do it again. Walking around these walls, I thought by now they'd fall, but you have never failed me. For change to come, knowing the battles won, for you have never failed me, Lord. Your promise, your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness.
Welcome to all of our faithful saints. God loves to see you in his house. The Song of Solomon beautifully depicts how God feels when he sees his people. <clears throat> Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 14 says, Oh, my dove, that art in the clefts of the rock, in the secret places of the stairs. Let me see thy countenance. Let me hear thy voice. So, for sweet is thy voice, thy countenance is comely. That's how God feels about seeing his church, his beloved, his only one. Hallelujah. I don't know. We, my wife and I have been married uh, 50 years now. <clears throat> And I remember jumping in a little car that uh, I had put together when I was uh, 15 years old. And I wasn't a mechanic. The fact that it ran hot before I got back <laughs> verified that. <laughs> but uh, I had called over to her house, and her brother says, no, 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 her, her and her mother, they went up to Opelika. And I jumped in that little car, and I tore off to Opelika. I just had to see her. Now, I knew what she looked like. I'd seen her before. But I had to just, I had to look in those beautiful baby blue eyes, see that long blonde hair. I just had to see her. Matter of fact, I married her so I could look at her all the time. <laughs> but that's how God feels when you come to his house. Oh, my. My dove. That are in the cliffs of the rock. In other words, don't hide. Stop hiding from. Come back from Opelika. I want to look at you. Mm. Let me see thy countenance. Let me hear thy voice. Sweet is thy voice, and thy countenance is comely. God loves to see his church in his house. He loves to see his beloved when she slips out from the shadows of the lower stairway and ascends the stairs to visit with him in quiet solitude of personal prayer. And when she enters the door of his house, God loves to see his people, his church, his bride. And we ought to feel just that way about coming to see him. Nobody say amen. Let the ushers come. Matthew chapter 9, verse 27 says this. And when Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. And when he was coming to the house, the blind men came to him. And Jesus saith unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? And they said unto him, Yes, Lord. No hesitation. No reservation. Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, listen to this part, According to your faith, according to your faith, be it unto you. And their eyes were open. I want you to have faith that God is going to bless you when you give. You hear me? The blessing should be according to your faith. I said the blessing ought to be according to your faith. You have faith. God, I believe your word, and your word says, if I give, Lord, if I sow the seed, you'll give the harvest. If I give, Lord, you'll give the blessing. And I can testify that God is as good as his word. Anybody else give that testimony? Amen. God is good as his word. Lord, thank you for the privilege we have to give. Thank you because you've given so much. You set the example for our giving when you gave it all the way on Calvary. And I pray that as we give right now, you would bless the gift and the giver as we give is unto you. In Jesus' name, everyone said amen. God bless you as you give.
have your Bibles and we can turn to the book of 2 Kings chapter 4 and verse 1. I may not be preaching or reaching for everyone this morning, but I do believe there's at least one here that needs this. And the one that needs to hear it is worth it. 2 Kings chapter 4 and verse 1. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord. And the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? What do you have in your house? She said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house, save except for a pot of oil. Then he said, Go borrow the vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shalt pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons, who brought the vessels to her. And she poured out, and it came to pass when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. I want to preach with the help of the Holy Ghost this morning from this thought. If there is a vessel, the oil will flow. Come on, I, I believe there's a vessel here that needs this this morning. If there is a vessel, the oil will flow. Would you help me pray one more time? Lift your voice, your hands. Jesus, we love you. We need you in this moment. God, I can't do anything on my own. I'm limited. I am unable. I am incapable. And I understand that. But Lord, by the authority of the Holy Ghost, anything can happen with any vessel that would make themselves available. So I pray that you would open up hearts and minds and speak into our hearing today touch somebody's life forever and change them in this place in jesus name amen you can be seated quite possibly the most frustrating thing to my wife i always pick on her is for her to see me walk through the door after a long day's work and i'm no longer holding that tupperware container that she sent me off to work with God forbid that that little insignificant container gets left behind. I, I don't know how many of my brothers in the house maybe can help me preach this morning, but I believe that my wife goes down while I'm fast asleep and she's there taking an inventory of all of the, all of the containers under the counter and all the silverware, and I think she does that. She will swear to you. That I've got some kind of secret silverware stash hiding out at work somewhere. Truth is, I, I really don't see what the big issue is. We've got like 25 of the exact same forks in the drawer. I've got 90 different Tupperware containers under the, con under the counter. And I can't ever find the tops to go with them, but the, the containers are there. Anybody else have that problem? And it's not like any of the containers are a limited edition. They're not collector's items. But somehow, she almost has this innate ability to understand the value of one vessel. And I don't think she's caught on to it yet. But I've got some of her containers on the top shelf of my closet. It's okay, though, because I've got a really good excuse, brother. You know, I've got some items in those containers that have a certain intrinsic and, and sentimental value to me. Uh, there's some military patches, some different awards, some collectibles that I really can't put a price tag on. And so it almost seems crazy to me that I'm counting on a $5 Tupperware container to preserve the things that are treasured so mo mo much by me but you see the reality is that I need the vessels to preserve and to transport what is important 
Allow me to put things into perspective a little for you. One scientist estimated that if you took the value of all of the different elements of your flesh and all of your, all of your skin and you were to go and, and sell them on the market, you're gross if you do, but if you were to do that and sell them on the market, um, they, at most they would be worth $4.50. About the price of a, a Tupperware container. The Apostle Paul put it like this in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. In other words, we, we're okay and, and we're pretty right to think that on our own, we're insignificant. On our own, we're not, not capable of much. But there is, I believe, a paradigm shift that happens. The moment that God fills you with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And then you walk into your college campuses or high school campuses. Or you walk back onto your jobs or down the aisles of the supermarket. You can only go one way on the supermarkets now. When you encounter the mailman at, at, the, at the mailbox. And now you've got that one substance so powerful. That it can shake demonic realms and it can change the entire atmosphere around you. And yes, the vessel may seem insignificant. It's, it's not worth much in and of itself, but it's necessary because God wants to use it to transport the most valuable substance ever introduced in humanity into the most strategic places at the most strategic moments in time. God is still looking for a vessel to pour into. If there is a vessel, the oil will flow. Would somebody clap your hands to the Lord? In the Air Force, once you become a non-commissioned officer, you've got to write these enlisted performance reports on all of your troops. It's, it's really fun. And these reports that you write, they, they paint the picture of the airmen that you supervise so that when someone grabs the report and they read it they can understand the body of work and, and the value that this person is bringing to the team getting an amen from brother Tony it's a terrible <laughs> these reports are, are somewhat important because they help them get promoted and they help them to win certain awards and so if you you have a good airman you really want to set them apart from everybody else well, I was a, a transporter by trade, and uh, so it was our job to load cargo onto the aircrafts. And the problem is that you go out to these aircrafts with a load team, and you have five to seven people there. You're all doing the same thing, and it's a problem when you're trying to set the one you're supervising apart, and everybody is doing the same thing day in and, and day out. So you really have to learn to get creative on how you describe what your airman is doing. It's difficult. So an Air Force mentor of mine taught me, everybody is loading the same box. But what sets you apart is when you are able to capture what is inside of the box. Everybody is talking about the box. We live in a world where everybody is trying to bring glory to themselves and be the next big thing. But few people are trying to highlight what's on the inside of the box. Not everybody's speaking about the context, but what he was saying in other words is you're changing the report on your airmen by simply magnifying what is inside of the vessel. Because you see that the box is necessary to, to transport contents to their destination. The box is critical. It's, it's very important. It's needed. The contents can't ship without the box. But it's the contents. It's the ammo. It's the blood. It's the supplies that are really going to go forward and impact the destination they're going to. Our opening text tells the story of this woman. And she was married to a man of God. But now the man had passed away. And now this poor widow, she's found herself in a really desperate place I can only imagine but during that man of God's life maybe he didn't have much but he was depositing something into the faith account of his children sometimes as a parent you know we question 
whether or not what we're doing is really making an impact. And we go uh, get a little older and our kids start going crazy and you're wondering where in the world did I go wrong? But I came to tell you this morning that something is taking place every time you open the word of God with your children inside of your home and and daddy when you take the time at nighttime and you tuck your kids in and you bend on your knees and you start to pray and when you bring them to the house of God and when you're uh, involving them in the work of God and they're seeing your testimony they're watching your model of consistency and something is happened you are releasing the favor of God on your house that is going to outlive you This man had passed over to his eternal inheritance, but evidently he taught mama and his boys where to turn to. She could have called for the creditor and asked for another loan, or maybe she could have called to the psychiatrist and just got some medicine to cope, but she came to the right place. She came to the man of God. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17 says, Obey them that have the rule over you. And submit yourselves. I know it's a hard thing. That's a word we don't like. But the Bible says submit yourselves for they watch for your souls as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief. For that is unprofitable for who? For you. Listen, we live in a a crazy time. The world is absolutely bonkers out there. And I believe with all of my heart, more than at any point in history before, now is the time that you better attach yourself to the man of God in your life and listen to the instruction he's giving. She came to the man of God and this woman, she was, she was desperate and she was broken. She told Elisha, she said, since my husband died, you know, we've, we've gotten behind on our bills and it's gotten so bad that the creditor has come and he's going to take away my sons to be his slaves and Elisha said, well, what do you have in your house? Some of you didn't catch that. He said, tell me what you have in your house. See, she was already, this woman was already in possession of everything that God would need to bless her. She just needed a man of God to speak the word of faith into her and speak direction into her life. That's why it's so important that we're in the house of God, because we might be living with everything that we need, but we need a man of God to speak a word that would bridge the gap between faith and the potential of what you already have. The widow responded, she said, I don't have anything but a pot of oil. And I wish to God that I was able, you know, in in this week, I just tried to In my mind's eye, just see the look on Elisha's face. If anybody understood the power of the anointing, it was Elisha. If anybody understood the potential of that cheap little substance, it was Elisha. That same substance had run from the top of his head down to the bottom of his feet as Elijah had anointed him for the ministry. What Elisha was incapable of doing before now became possible because of the anointing power of the oil. Elisha understood that if you've got the oil, then you've got everything that you need. So he began to just give this woman some specific instructions. Sometimes the instructions we receive sound just absolutely crazy. But desperation will cause you to do some very desperate things. When you get sick and tired of being sick and tired, you'll do things that you've never done before to get to a place that you've never been before. He said, I want you to go and borrow some vessels from all of your neighbors. And he said, borrow empty vessels. Don't just go and get a couple of them. Get as many as you can and and bring them in. It it, 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 didn't matter. Um, it didn't matter if the vessels that she borrowed were darker in color. Hello? 
It didn't matter if they were lighter in color. It didn't matter if they were big or small, if it were uh, masculine or, or feminine. That didn't make a difference. Elisha didn't say, hey, uh, discard them if they have surface cracks or if they're not well put together. It didn't matter if the vessels came from the, the rich neighbor's house or the poor neighbor's house. The only direction that Elijah said is it only matters that the vessels were empty. I believe he told her empty vessels because sometimes we can be so full of the wrong thing that God is incapable of filling us with the right thing. Second Timothy chapter 2 and verse 20 says, In a large house there are articles not only of gold and silver but also of wood and clay. Some are for special purposes and some for common use. Those who cleanse themselves from the latter will be instruments for special purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. You've got to empty yourself so that Jesus can fill you. He said, when you come into your house, I want you to shut the door upon you and shut the door upon your boys. And I just want you to start pouring the oil into all the vessels that you've gathered and set them aside when they're full. Can I just tell somebody that it matters what you do when you shut the door to your home? Sometimes the reason, I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> Sometimes the reason that our kids grow up so confused is because they're seeing one version of daddy in the church and a different version of daddy at home. Your church and your home life, they must be consistent. The Bible says that this widow, she sent her sons to gather the vessels. She was involving her kids in the work of God. And they began to grab vessels from the neighbors. Maybe, maybe they were vessels that were no longer important to the neighbors. Maybe vessels they were ready to just throw out. Uh, and I'm feeling the Holy Ghost to speak to someone this morning. Sin is fun for a season. But when the world, the world gets done with you, they'll just throw you to the side. But Jesus loves broken people. He can use what everybody else is throwing out. She began to, to pour the oil until there were no more vessels to be filled. And the Bible says that the oil stayed. When you get the oil, you can never lose the oil. You can lose your salvation but you'll never lose the oil. Everything changed for this woman as the oil began to flow. Check this out. The creditor was coming to enslave her sons. But it was the oil that released them. I'm, I'm reaching to somebody, maybe you've been in sin for a long time and you're looking at a young man that was in sin for quite a while. And when everything else was tried and everything the world offered me, I attempted to take and to try it for myself. And it wasn't because I got bad instruction. I was raised in a good home. Daddy taught me the right way. But I, I made the decision to walk away. I made the decision to inflict pain upon myself. And when everything didn't work and I got deeper and deeper and more lost, it was only the Holy Ghost that released me. If you look in the Old Testament, it's filled with, with types and shadows of things that would be revealed and clarified later. And the oil in the Old Testament almost always typifies the Holy Ghost in the New Testament. So this is the message for you. Don't underestimate the power of the Holy Ghost to release you from a lifetime of bondage. All you need is the oil. And as long as there's a vessel, the oil is going to flow. Jesus, he commissioned the disciples in Luke chapter 24 and verse 44, 45 to 49. And I'm, I'm just going to paraphrase for the, the sake of time. He said, I want you to, to start in Jerusalem. And I want you to go preach a specific message. Preach repentance. Remission of sins in my name. We know that to be through water baptism and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. I want you to preach this, but... Um, here first and to the entire world but then he gave them a critical instruction he said wait we don't like the word wait 
But Jesus told the disciples, he said, wait, don't do anything until you are endued with power from on high. So they went into an upper room there in Jerusalem and they, they were waiting in prayer and in, in fasting. They were there about 10 days, the Bible teaches. And in Acts chapter 2 and verse 1, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly, somebody say suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Jesus said, tarry until you get the Holy Ghost. Because the oil is what the vessel needs. The experience was so loud. They didn't have any big microphones or PA systems, but uh, it was so loud that the people on the outside caught wind of what was happening. All the spectators that didn't really want to participate. When the 120 in the upper room had been filled with that Holy Ghost oil, finally they came out into the streets and they staggered out there. If you got the Holy Ghost, you kind of know what it means to to be drunk in the Holy Ghost sometimes. So they gathered and and they walked out into the streets. They began to stagger and the people were like, man, these guys are drunk. And so following the direction of, of Jesus, Peter stood up and he began to preach the first message to the first church. He had 119 other guys and girls behind him. Many of the disciples of Jesus, if he preached the wrong thing, It never would have made it into the Bible. Somebody would have stood up behind him and said, hey, Bubba, that wasn't what Jesus told us to do. But he was preaching the word that Jesus gave. He preached Christ crucified. Thank God for the cross. He told the crowd, you are responsible for this. And conviction sets in. Man, you've got to do something when conviction sets in. Acts chapter 2 and 37, now when they had heard this, they were pricked in the heart. They said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? It's not doing us any good to feel conviction and not have any direction afterwards. Peter, Jesus had given Peter the keys to the kingdom of heaven. What do you do with keys? You unlock something. Verse 38, then Peter said unto them, repent. Repent. And be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. It's probably been my favorite part of the scripture. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. In other words, what Peter was saying is as long as we have a vessel. As long as there's still a vessel, the oil is still going to flow. In fact, the scripture says, and this is something we can get ready for in the time we live in, that in the last days, God is going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. This woman, she was, she was desperate because she was empty. And maybe you're here this morning and you feel like you're okay because you have enough. But somebody is here this morning in a very desperate place because you're either empty or only half full. When the vessel stopped coming into the woman's house, the oil stopped flowing because there has to be a vessel to flow into. And I stand here before you. I know this is not no preach down the house message, but I feel it in the Holy Ghost. I stand here 2000 years later, still preaching to all that are afar off to tell you that if there is a vessel, if there's one vessel here. It's enough for him to flow. Jesus told the disciples, he said, tarry in Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. Why? Because the vessel on its own, it's not enough to have a significant impact on the world. But it only took one moment. For insignificant vessels to be filled with one substance so powerful that it could literally alter the course of humanity for every single person that would partake. I'm closing. If we can stand together. 
as I said, I may be only just reaching for one person that walked in here as just a, a busted up, broken vessel. I know sometimes life looks hopeless and you feel insignificant. Mary and Martha, they came to Jesus and they told Jesus, they said, you know, Lazarus is dead. If you had came a few days ago, everything would have been all right, but he's already been dead for three days. And by now, in three days, his body is decomposing. He's got, he already has the odor of, of a dead person. In other words, they were saying, Jesus, it's, it's hopeless. Does anybody here feel hopeless, helpless? But Jesus said, take me to the impossible place. Take me into the place where you think that all hope is already lost. Take me to the vessel that's so empty and so desolate that's even already devoid of, of human life. And you see, when, when science and modern medicine has already run its course, when the doctor says, I, I don't have an answer and the psychiatrist, the best he can offer is another pill to, to try to help you cope. When earth cannot move, heaven still can. Jesus came to the tomb and he said, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus came just walking up out of the tomb, but he was still bound by the linens that he was buried in. Until Jesus commanded, loose him and let him go. All of a sudden, the vessel that seemed useless, seemed vacant, absent of life, the vessel that just a few moments before had no value left was all of a sudden released to make an impact on his world. And somebody walked into the room this morning still bound up by the linens of your past. And Jesus is saying, take the oil into the place where you think all hope is lost. God is looking for a vessel to fill. Come on, the altars are already open if you're going to come. The restriction was not on the amount of oil that this woman could have. The only requirement was that she had another vessel. Elisha didn't tell the woman. He didn't say, stand here so that I can bless you. Her blessing was dependent upon her doing something. We've got to move. Salvation is free and sometimes we take that and we think, well, he's done everything so I don't need to do anything. It's free but it will cost you something. One man said to be saved, a life lived for Jesus is going to cost you your life. It's going to cost you commitment. It'll cost you faithfulness. God doesn't ration the oil, but God needs a vessel. If you're here this morning, you've never been filled with the Holy Ghost, never been baptized in Jesus' name. I know it's two different things, but I can't think of a better day than today. The Bible says that today is the day of salvation. It's the only day we've been promised. If you're here this morning and your vessel is full of brokenness or, or sickness or bitterness, you can bring what you have to Him. He can tip it over. He can empty out all of the, the, the hurt and the frustration, the fear, the sin. And He can fill you with the oil of the Holy Ghost. Amen. If you're here this morning and that's you, you can come. The altars are open.
us more like you, Jesus. Oh, fill us up, oh God. We want to be vessels. Oh, use us, Lord. Oh, use us, Lord. Fill me up till there's nothing left but you. Till there's nothing left but you. Oh, 